All right, we're at the uh, Dome of Visions in Stockholm for the first podcast. It's uh, September 29, 2015, and this is a series of podcasts in which we discuss the future of humanity in outer space. Uh, my name is Angelo Vermeulen, and I'm flanked by two guests, Mats Clausen and Peter Ratzmann. And today we're going to discuss the broader future of uh, space exploration and where we are now and what could be a potential future of space exploration. But I want to start with uh, a little introduction by the two of you. Let's start with uh, Peter on my left side here. Uh, if I understood well, you're a systems engineer working at a space company here in Sweden, is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. I started originally with the Swedish Space Corporation in 1983. That's the Swedish, uh, uh, a Swedish space company owned by the government, in fact. And then I was working with all Swedish satellites until, uh, um, scientific satellites until 2010, at which, or 2011, at which time we were sold to a, a German company, OHP, who is responsible for the European uh, navigation satellites, Galileo, for example. Uh -huh. And uh, now our company specializes in electric propulsion and attitude control systems, uh, mainly to be used on telecommunication satellites. Okay. Cool. Mats, you're both an author and also a bookseller. You have quite a specific bookstore here in Stockholm. Uh, can you tell a bit more? Yeah, uh, yes, this? indeed. The, the, it's called the Science Fiction Bookshop. So we specialize, as obviously you can hear, in the science fiction, fantasy and horror books. Okay. Uh, that's, that's the main... Uh, yeah, that's, that's what we sell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been around for... A, almost 30 years now, selling these books, reading these books, and these days, nowadays, also writing these books, uh, young adult novels. Okay. Yes. And you've been, uh, I read somewhere on the internet that you're dreaming about space. What's your relation to space exploration? Um, well, as an avid science fiction reader, there is, there is a myth or... or, or as an ongoing dream is in almost all science fiction literature that we have to reach, go for the stars, begin mm -hmm. with the solar system and then reach for the stars. Exactly. <laughs> and that's quite a romantic dream, of course. Uh, but I got hooked at that dream, I guess, in, in, when I was just a young boy. And that's what I, where I'm still am. You never, <laughs> I'm afraid. You, you never wanted to be an astronaut? <laughs> yes, uh, yes, of course. I, I, but somehow... Yes, of course, we'd like to go to the moon to Mars, of course. Okay. But I was quite satisfied to dream about it as well. <laughs> okay, that really, sounds wonderful. Really, that's because I'm getting old, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, older, at least. <laughs> so let's, I, let, let's talk about uh, where we are right now. Um, if we look at the current state of space exploration, it seems that we might be a little stuck. And the question is, do we need some radical breakthrough in physics before we can move to the next step of deeper space exploration? Or do we simply need a bit more dedication from agencies? Maybe that's the, the problem. For example, there is a recurrent critique uh, about NASA, like that NASA is too slow and hasn't been making the right decisions. Why aren't we back on the moon? You know, we were doing well in the 70s, 60s and 70s, and then the, moon, the lunar program stopped, and that's you know, where we ended. We went back to low Earth orbit, and that's where we stayed. Also, uh, generally, human spaceflight is under huge pressure. I mean, I know that the European Space Agency is uh, cutting budgets on human spaceflight. Uh, the same thing uh, probably happens at NASA. Um, there is, of course, commercial spaceflight now that is in full development, mostly by American companies. Um, but that seems to be focused mostly on maintaining the status quo, and not it, it's still low Earth orbit. So what do we need? What do we need to make that big next step, that big next leap? I would love to hear uh, both of your, uh, your opinions about this. Uh, okay. Um, well, well, I think, um, I mean, obviously distances are so huge uh, in the universe. So with our current uh, technology, one can env envisage basically more powerful, larger rockets. But we're still, we're talking maybe tens of thousands of years to get to the nearest star. So, uh, so un unless one thinks of something radically different, like this film Interstellar, where you're opening a you know wormhole or something in the universe, it's difficult to see how we can actually travel to another star, given the current knowledge and uh, of technology and stuff. But to me, I think it's so fascinating. We are on the verge of being able to establish communications, I would say, with other civilizations in the sense that we can now detect planets which have the which basically have Earth-like um, conditions in the atmospheres and stuff. We're just reaching that point before we've only seen like Jupiter yes. size. And what's interesting 
Is Do you think we can actually communicate with them? I know we can observe, yeah, yeah. for example, the weather patterns on planets revolving around different stars. Yeah, but yeah. you just mentioned communicating. That's a whole different story. No? Mm. Do you really believe we can I, I think so. Yeah. Well, uh, certainly I, I think we can. That is ju just basically uh, standard technology with uh, greatly amplified, I mean, uh, sufficient uh, radio and frequency. It would take a long power. time before our signal would get there. Uh, no, right? absolutely, absolutely. But we can, when I say communicate, let's say one-way communication, please. Okay. We could listen to their signals ah, okay. and listen. You, You've probably seen this film Cosmos where they course, end up, yeah. you know, <laughs> looking at the first live transmission from Earth. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so I think that's an interesting thing. But if we look a bit more uh, near term, I think what is reasonable and possible, obviously, is, is to go to the outer planets. Personally, I don't. It's a question of how much, how interesting that is, and, and uh, how much one is willing to invest in that. You know, talking about submarines under the Europe uh, ice sheet, this type of yes, stuff. Yes, exactly. And it's neat, but I mean, it, you have to stand, uh, place it in relation to how much would that cost, and how much would it trigger the imagination of the average youth today? Just to clarify for the listeners, so yeah. uh, Europa which is a moon of, um, uh, of Jupiter, of Jupiter yeah. has this huge ice sheet around it, and yes. then underneath there is an ocean, yeah. and an idea is to explore that ocean right. using a exactly. submarine, basically. Yeah. So a submarine which that could, would be launched from Earth, and then somehow find its way under the ice sheet, and then, yes, which would be a tremendous, uh, yeah, yeah. a tremendous challenge, of course. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so you're quite, you finished by saying the question is how much that would cost, how yes. interesting that would be. And, and personally, if I leave, let's say, the realms of what's possible exactly today, I, I personally am not so incre in, incredibly intrigued by the fact that they could find some very simple virus or bacteria in our solar system. Of course, it has philosophical implications, yes, of life, course. not just on Earth. But to me, it's, it's much more interesting, for example, really uh, listening to nearby stars. I mean, really trying to find intelligent uh, communications coming from, from uh, new transmissions. That to me is... And the, you think uh, that's more of a realistic option yes, that we will... Yes, absolutely, because we have the possibility of constructing incredibly sensitive telescopes through interferometric But techniques. that's looking like a needle in a haystack, right? I mean, no, how no, it isn't. It, we... It's not, no, no. I mean, it doesn't. With today's satellites, they can they, they can scan like thousands of planets, ex, extraterrestrial planets, uh, exoplanets per year. They mm -hmm. can do that. They look at the spectrum and it, they find that almost every star harbors a, pl a planetary system. This is something. Yes, that yes, of course. So, it's, so just the sheer amount of planets there is are like incredible. There are so many yeah. planets around. Yes, that's but, but, very but true. But then once you could, you could uh, get a really sensitive antenna, I think you could pick up rather quickly if if they were intelligent. Um, and would you would you suggest to um, are you expecting that if there is another civilization that they would actively send out a signal or would you just listen to the the noise that they're generating it's like mm. there's this beautiful image uh, it's a con it's a bit of a conceptual image that um, there is this bubble of electromagnetic in information that travels away from earth yes. and the outer shell of electromagnetic radiation are the first radio communications yes. and yep. it's you know it's, it, it just keeps yeah. expanding right are you talking about like artifacts of, of technology on another planet or are you talking about very directed communication that is sent out by another no I, I would mean artifacts because like artifacts. I personally do okay. not think it a good idea to send out directed one-way communications I okay. know this was done by the US uh, Drake and, and company in the 1970s I, I think uh -huh. that's crazy because obviously you just look statistically any civilization intelligent enough to intercept understand our signals are statistically likely to be much much more advanced than us and why is this because we've only had the ability to send out radio transmissions for 70 80 years okay so if you understand what i mean that's that's the the floor if you like so all technology above that level uh, they can then uh, so statistically it's almost impossible that they will be as dumb as we are they will always be much think, more intelligent and you think that with the smartness of this other civilization comes the the drive to colon to to uh, yeah to colonialize uh, Earth or to occupy Earth. Well, the ability, I would say, rather, and but above all, I think more frightening. It's that the complete decision would lie in the more intelligent race, in the same way okay. as we, we would, humans. We, we would be subjugated. That's yes, your, your yes, concern. concern. I'm okay. supposed to be the science fiction writer. You yeah, supposed yeah, yeah, to be no. The no this is <laughs> uh, quite unexpected. I was like, <laughs> I'm going to invite a down-to-earth engineer and a science fiction writer, and yeah. now the, the engineer turns out to have uh, quite interesting ideas. <laughs> let's let's move to maths for a second so let's let's get back to the same question so what do you think is needed to move space exploration into really a different <coughs> level well of course uh, technological breakthroughs 
an, another way of uh, you say rocket propellants we, we propulsion yes I think that's necessary but apart from that I think we need in, in these days that is a little bit of gloom and doom uh, the apocalypse is, is coming in in the form of climate change and so on whatever pandemics uh, there's a whole range of new ways for the humankind to to go under these days uh, I think we need and and um, a new way to look at life, basically. Uh, one, one statement, I would say, is we need to get off this planet. And you agree with that statement, or you don't? Certainly I do. Uh, because of these, if, let's face it, there's, there's a very possible <laughs> that we actually, in, in a couple of hundred years, civilization as we know it is no more. Uh -huh. That might be. If, if we can't, if the climate change, we, we do not know. And then it's stupid to to remain on Earth. Of course, we have to move out in space. We have to colonize this, the whole solar system. We have to have uh, space, not space station, space cities in in so, so orbit. So let's, let's backtrack a little bit. Yes. Why are you so convinced that we have to leave Earth? Because if 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 the worst case scenario turns out to be true. Yeah, but even with climate change, I mean, it's going to cause a lot of suffering. But do you think the entire human race will be wiped out from the planet? I mean, if we're talking about colonizing Mars, which are environmental conditions that are in no way comparable to Earth, they're really hostile, but we're happily talking about colonizing Earth. Why couldn't we stay on Earth, even though it would get a little more difficult to stay there? And it might be impossible to stay on Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that case, it would be stupid to, to not look at the option, let's move out in space. Mm -hmm. And okay, let's let's go, let's go to Mars. Let's terraform Mars, as we say, yes, make it Earth-like. Well, like. Uh, let's say it takes about one thousand years. Mm -hmm. So it's not for for the immediate future. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the far future. And 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 the dream about colonizing the solar system. Yes. There is another way to look at it. Um, one way is this technological way this utopian vision, humankind spreading out in, in, the, in the cosmos. But if you like, if you will, would like to remain with two feet on the Earth, which you obviously like, then we can have, have use it as a metaphor. We have to think anew, think about Mars, yes. and the whole world. Utopia, the word in Greek, I guess, means no place. Mm -hmm. But Mars is a place. Mm -hmm although far off in, in, in the solar system, but there is a real place that we can go, that we can build a new utopia. There is no nations, no religions, no ide ideologies, except these we so take you, with us. So you're, you're saying that space offers an opportunity to start from scratch. Is that what you're yes. saying? Yes. Yeah, what I'm saying now is we, we can project our thoughts at the utopian society on Mars, for instance, and then maybe it will bounce back and we do things on Earth instead. So we really be need yeah. to think anew. Okay, is that what you're meaning with we need to, maybe we need to rethink life and we need to think yes, about life the, in a different yes. way? Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, what may do you may what I come with a horrible thought here and yes, a direct connection to this because I really think it's interesting what you're saying. If we look at historically, what has happened when we've colonized other continents? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, after a while, they want their independence, and at some point, they can always be, they can even become our enemies. Now, just to imagine. I mean, we were enemies to pretty much to begin with. I agree, <laughs> agree. But now let's move fast forward ten thousand years. You have your colony with, with say, a million people on Mars, mm. and then you have these other billions on Earth, and, and, and after a while, they, they're also starting to think Mars, mm, nice place, and mm -hmm. the guys on Mars are saying, forget it, we, we built this. Uh, to me, that is a realistic scenario, given That's actually interesting, a rather yes. primitive ways we human beings think. It's so there would be planetary conflicts. Yes, I, I think That's very soon they realistic. would feel like Martians are not uh, uh, Earthlings. That, yes. might, that might be so, but yeah, yeah and, and probably it will be so in that case, but we, we cannot tell them, uh, no, 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 Mars is too crowded, you go to Europe instead, yeah. because we terraform Europe as well, yeah, yeah. or, yeah. or we, we, perhaps these giant space cities, mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. If we think about current trends, and we go back to commercial spaceflight, mm. all, like I said, all these different American programs, I mean, Elon Musk is probably one of the most famous persons, but there are many other companies, apart from SpaceX, that are do, trying to do this. Um, there are basically two main directions in which commercial spaceflight is being developed. 
The first one is bringing people into low Earth orbit to the space station or for tourism. The second one is asteroid mining. That's the two paradigms that are currently full on being developed. Mm. How do you feel about these developments? Do you think these are the right priorities? Okay, yeah, I can begin. Uh, yes. Um, well, well, I really do admire Elon Musk, of course, I have to. He said his mission is to go to Mars, and he's building rockets, and, and, and the Tesla cars and so on. So obviously, he's a, he's a great, he has great ideas, and, and uh, obviously make them real as well, uh, at least so far. But on the other hand, I think if we should think that entrepreneurs will solve all our problems on Earth or, or, or get us to Mars solely, that would be stupid because after all, Elon Musk and all the other companies that are doing good things, if their business should drop, the first thing they will do, of course, Mars costs too much, sorry, no. So I think we definitely have to back up the state, the governments has to be a huge part of the so if the so Preferably the U world government, because the not, not the United States government. So you mean that mm. uh, colonizing space with profit as a bottom line is a very risky business? Because if prof a profit runs out or is, is being That's endangered, saying, yes. then, well, the people that are out there are mm. on their own, pretty yeah. much. Mm. It's a bit similar, the similar issue with Mars One. It's the, the project mm. in which they want to send people to Mars and then they can never come back and it's part of a reality show. What will happen if people are no longer interested? And there is no more money coming in. Exactly. Yeah. Will yeah. they stop sending supplies? I mean, it's a very similar scenario yeah. and a yeah. tricky thing. Yeah. But uh, Peter, you also wanted to add something? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, personally, I, I have asteroid mining, I think, is really um, crap. It's I, crap. It, yeah. Why is it crap? It's crap because they, the arguments used really don't hold water. And I'm Okay, explain, elaborate. Yeah, because yeah. there's a lot of money potential that yes, could be made with yes, asteroid mining. Exactly. I mean, I've seen the figures and it's astronomical, it's astronomical what they're astronomical worth. And, and I think what, what we see is that venture capital now is, is really becoming available to put on, 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 on all kinds of space missions. And, uh -huh. and even that they have uh, sort of these names, I mean, from, from really serious companies and stuff, to, g to give them a lot of credibility, these companies, yes. uh, planetary resources, whatever they're called. But yes. if, you, if you make a quick calculation, you will find you cannot launch, even if you find platinum, for example. I mean, it's true that some of these asteroids have abundances of, of, of precious metals, which are like 30 times higher than an Earth. But if you translate this into the cost per kilo, you will find it's more expensive just to launch a kilo uh, from Earth and land on an asteroid getting something back that even if you came home with huge lumps of platinum, it's incredibly expensive to do this type of assault return missions with today's technology. With today's technology. Yes, yeah. And, and uh, so, so I, I really don't believe that thing. And, and, and I, but I think the reason, my, 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 my uh, reason for thinking why are these guys attracting money it's because they want to create a hype and then do an exit and make a lot of money because shares have risen through the roof. That's my only speculation because anyone... So it's a bit of a scam. It is a scam. It's an definitely interplanetary a scam. scam. Yes. Or a cosmic scam yeah, or it, a solar system scam. It's a scam. bit like you, you see all professional athletes today, almost all, are doing advertising for betting sites on the internet. And I'm always horrified. I, I think they're really pretending that has something to do with, with, with uh, sports or football this betting thing so they're just attracting people in, into betting through internet under the pretense that they you know s supporting sport in some fashion which they're not not in these private betting sites yeah i think uh, asteroid mining it's, it's a little bit like reading science fiction in the from, from the 50s or 40s yeah, yeah. uh complete with uh, as that kind of literature used to be then slightly right-wing american dream of an entrepreneur again doing business in space uh, for saving mankind uh, and grabbing it all yes it's it, yeah. Yeah. or uncle Scrooge if you like yes. so it's a little bit like that yes <laughs> and also I think one of the one of the ethical issues there is that outer space becomes this open field where whatever you can grab you can just destroy it entirely yes. and throw it on the market mm -hmm. yeah. which is the environmental destruction we've seen on earth for such it's, a long time exactly so ethically there is something really uh, tricky about I agree, that whole I agree that I agree with that also yeah. but I do I am I mean, there is a website um, that actually lists the costs and the return mm -hmm. of asteroid mining, and mm -hmm. it looks relative. It looks quite convincing mm -hmm. that if you would invest this huge amount of money needed to start the mining, that mm -hmm. actually you would get a return on your investment. Mm -hmm. you, you would actually make profits. 
Um, but this is contradicting to what you're saying, that actually you would not make a profit bringing those precious metals back to Earth. No, I mean, I, I did it from the other way around. I, I was ch checking what are the abundances of these things and then d disregarding the difficulties of doing mining in a zero, more or less zero-G environment, mm -hmm. which is a tremendous difficulty. Okay. I was just looking at the actual launch costs today. It's obvious that if you say launch costs will go down to one-tenth, then ah, of course the balance okay. changes, but okay. I, so I'm suspecting that's the kind of you know assumptions they that make. That they make, yeah. okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So now I'm going to ask you a more hypo hypothetical question. Let's assume that budgets are not really an issue, and that we can plan whatever we plan. I would love to hear from you how you would envision that we would we would colonize the solar system. How would it look like if I take a bird's eye view and it would look down at the solar system after it's been, after it's been colonized? Um, how would it look like? What kind of structures would you and, and, and situations would you envision? We'd love to, to hear. Maybe oh dear. Yeah, okay. I mean, as you can take it as far as you want. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, of course, not space stations, but space cities. Uh, we need to build an infrastructure in space. Uh, in space city, what, what, is that? what does that mean? Well, I do uh, 1,000, when 10,000 people can live, maybe. In, a, in, a, in an architecture that is in the solar system or on a planet? No, or? no, in, in, in orbit around the Earth, uh, with artificial gravity and, and uh, all the basic human needs. Uh, when we grew our crops, we, we, uh, we live there. Okay. People will be born there, should live there, die there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's a little bit also an old science fiction dream, but it's so, no, no, no. It's, it's so very nice dream. So of nice. course, it's beautiful. <laughs> and I of think. course the moon, we can live on the moon, we can terraform on the moon as well. We can live uh, not on the surface, but under the surface. We can, we can what do you mean with terraforming? Because the moon has no atmosphere and I think it's going to be difficult no, to no, okay. retain yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, it's, it's, it's a better word suited for Mars. But we can, we can make, make, habitable. make it habitable. habitable. That's yeah. better, okay. yes. Um, and then Mars, of course. And obviously, all the moons around the gas giants, and we can, and the asteroids we can live on, we can, um, and then slowly, slowly but surely maybe, reach for the stars in some way. I do not know. Like a base station to, yes, to the but park. Th 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 this dream or vision or, or stupidity, if you like, yeah. we also have to change ourselves. We can't remain like we are today. If we are going to live, say, on, on uh, Europe, Jupiter's uh, the on Europa. moon, yeah, on, on Europa, Europa. Uh, the different gravity, and so on. We have we need to to um, pimp ourselves, our bodies. Okay. Of course. Body augmentation. Yes, yes. body augmentation. That's the word. Um, biologically different creatures. We must be more than human to achieve this, and that's what we're doing anyway now. Yeah, it's so. Sort so of, I need yeah. natural to continue in that direction. Gene therapy is a good example of that. For, yes, you indeed. Modify your genetic yeah. makeup locally. Yes. To uh, to change your characteristics. Yes. Yeah. And all the while, our Earth will remain home, but we will not. We will be able to live other places. And how do you see the connection between all these? Because we're, what we're talking now is called post-planetary design. Mm -hmm. It's design intended for an era where humanity, where humanity can live on a planet, but there are also other options. Um, how do you see the connection between all these different locations and peoples? How would how do you have any idea about this? We already brought it up briefly that conflicts might be part of the equation, or how mm -hmm. how do you think it, it would work out? Well, since we, we might be able to change our biology, but of course we, we, that's not so easy to change the way we think, the way we are. Okay. And conflict is, is in our nature, it seems. So, so that's, that's a tough one. Uh, let's invent a new ideology, maybe. Not, not one that's rooted in the 17th or 18th century, something new for the modern times. Okay. Maybe up a unifying something like that, that yes, update socialist maybe or liberalist pip it to make it better suited for modern people technology and so on mm -hmm. might be something for philosophers to broaden so you think a, a sort of new ideological political system would be really important to, absolutely, keep, to keep that whole yeah, thing yeah. together otherwise it, it will all crumble go down okay and not a strictly scientific rational approach because no. you could also opt for that, no, strictly that, secular. That, yes, but that would be um, stupid. You, you could be techno technology, technology optimistic, of course. Yeah. We can change everything with technology and science. Mm -hmm. But uh, as, as uh, we are still human in our minds. 
Yeah. And that's the biggest problem, I think. Yeah. I just used the word secular. I need to be careful here. Yeah, it's so, secular, absolutely secular. So, so secular, there's, of course, the, the question of will there be a sort of new religion that is going to be developed or will we ditch religion entirely and will we strictly focus on a political ideology? I mean, those, those are different I find it hard to think that we ditch religion because that that's, a thing, that's right? also part of us. But hopefully we, we can, uh, yeah, why not invent a new religion? Maybe God is, uh, what should we say, God, the new God is change, maybe? Or something else, uh, let's, uh, let's get rid of the old gods, desert sure. gods. Please. Peter, what do you think? <laughs> what do you think when you hear all of this? Do you agree? Do you, I do you envision a similar kind of future? I think the easiest way, I mean, if we want to move away from Earth for whatever reason, I think the easiest thing to do actually is, is to build large space stations. I think that's simpler than the terraforming. And the reason is simply it's much, much less costly to move things up to low Earth orbit or let's say the same orbit as the Earth is. We could like, let's say, put us on the other side of the sun, but basically in an Earth orbit, it's, we could get down the cost like almost two orders of magnitude compared to if you want to terraform Mars. Uh, but then, on the other hand, we had 100 astronauts here uh, last week. Uh, it's this here at the Dome of Visions. In, in fact, yes, they had lunch here, I understand. Yeah. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is and we had dinner with them afterwards, and all of them say when they get up into space, what do they look at? Do they look at the stars? Mm. No, they look down at Earth because Earth mm. is so beautiful. And I, I just think... Uh, the same thing will happen here. Even if you have a really nice, you know, football-sized, huge space station, perfect green fields, people will... It, 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 Earth will have to look really, really crappy if they are to prefer that artificial, you know, life-sustainable uh, habitat up there rather than trying to fix the problems on Earth, I think. But, but that's my feeling. It's, um, so your vision of, of a colonized solar system is much more Earth-centered. It's it, basically it is, that yes. we're staying in the vicinity of Earth. Yes. We're building space stations around yeah. Earth, but we're not really moving out. No. And so you don't even think we're going to colonize Mars or the Moon? It's not going to happen, uh, is it? To me, I really don't think it's that interesting. I mean, personally, I think it would be really interesting if we could develop some kind of technology for the future where we actually could visit other stars other solar systems, then a completely okay. different scenario opens up. Then we're okay. talking sort of big time colonization of the universe, yeah. but someone else may, may uh, win. So, if, that I race, so. if I understand well, Peter, <laughs> you're not so solar system centered. No. Because no. You're, one of the things you, you told us yeah. before is like, well, I'm not very interested in looking for a microbe on a different planet in our solar mm. system. Mm. I'm much more interested to look for <laughs> civilizations in a different part of the galaxy. Yeah. And now you're saying, once again, colonizing space, well, not so interested in colonizing the entire solar system, I prefer to, you know, put all our efforts in traveling to a different star. Yeah. Is well, that is that what I'm? What yes, I'm exactly. But but then once again, if there is a really environmental problem on Earth, then then I, I think again that space stations, large space stations close to Earth, is a more affordable scenario, and and a better scenario in the case that it's easier and faster to come home. And in Mars, you know, Mars is, is at opposition. It's going to take like eight months to get back home. And, True. I think my personal opinion is a little bit in between those these two positions. Um, the way I look at it personally is a bit like polar bases. Oh. We haven't colonized the poles, but you know there's a few stations there, and it's driven by territorial interests. Oh. And I think that's my guess is that's going to happen throughout the solar system. There will be bases, but there won't be actual entire cities. I'm not really expecting that in the immediate future, not even in the near nearby future. Mm -hmm. But I think there will be several bases because countries want to be somehow have a stake there. Yeah. And then true, maybe we'll develop discover some new law of physics and then we'll develop something that to travel yeah. beyond our solar system yeah. which much much higher speeds. But who knows what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. I mean these are all very interesting uh, uh, I just have to to I agree with you Peter that um, the stars, yes. I mean Mars, that's water, yes. We might find our microbes swimming around in the water, yeah. but how sexy is that? Yes. Not at yeah. all. <laughs> Please. Yeah. <laughs> <But> <laughs> yeah. Yesterday, NASA went out this with this <coughs> press release, and I mean, it just smelled of, hey, guys, now we have to motivate these huge tax expenditures. Mm. We've made this. I mean, we've known there's been a water ice up there for ages. So it, mm. to me, it was not such a dramatic discovery. And, and uh, again, well, they have to motivate their expenditures to the American taxpayers, obviously. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, and NASA is, is brilliant at public relations, of yes, course. They, yes. they know how to, um, how to play the game. But yeah. I, st I must say I was, I was extremely excited yesterday when I heard about the, okay. the yeah. discovery of liquid water on the surface. I'm a biologist, so yeah, yeah. Um, 
the moment we will discover life on Mars, I'm, I'm going to go nuts for sure. <laughs> you're, you're going to watch? I'm going to go nuts. I mean, this oh, is yeah. going to be yeah. this is going to be major for me. But, but uh, to the philosophical impli implications, or, or I what think both you? both as yeah. a biologist, yeah. The, yeah. The, just the, the sheer interest on on, on understanding how yeah. life in different places can. It, have is, has evolved yeah. and is establishing itself mm. just from a biological perspective yeah. but of course also from a philosophical and cultural perspective yeah. it shifts everything yeah. and uh, it suddenly opens up so much more so yeah. for me as somebody who works who works closely uh, with, with astrobiologists this yeah. is, is I find it extremely exciting yeah. Yeah. to look for life throughout the solar system the thing is looking for life in the solar system is kind of feasible Yep. So that's why I'm, I'm yeah. very interested in, yep. even though uh, my personal research is very focused on, on interstellar travel. Uh, mm. That's that's the, the topic that I'm currently exploring. Yeah. But um, I'm, I'm interested in all of that. Yeah. <laughs> may, may, may I just question your assumption there? It changes yes. everything you say. If we find uh, life in the solar system, alien life, or maybe what kind of life it is. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking about it, this recently. If, if we should find microbes or even get a CETIS signal from way out in the galaxy uh -huh. that goes out, yes, there is alien life, mm -hmm. indeed. But what I see, yes, in, in the long term, I guess, philosophically and maybe religion and, and such things, but the daily life on Earth, the next day I will be sitting at uh, here mm -hmm. or, or eating lunch at the normal place, I would go to work, nothing would change. You no, know, no, I do think it would have a tremendous impact on the collective. Oh. It would have a tr discovering life outside of Earth would have a tremendous impact on the collective psyche of humanity, mm -hmm. because first of all, religion has to be adjusted. And yeah. interesting, you know, for example, the Catholic Church is already working on how they will reinterpret the Bible as soon as yes. life is discovered outside Earth yeah. to make yeah. it work. Yeah. Um, the, just the sheer notion that there is a second Eden is for will be for um, for many peoples even, and also non 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 Christians will be a, a huge a huge shift. Um, it's just, it's the same thing what is happening with the discovery that was just brought up uh, by Peter a while ago, that there is more planets in our galaxy than stars, hmm. which is something that still has not penetrated the collective imagination no, no. yet. If hmm. you ask people to draw a galaxy, they will draw stars. Yes. And actually they should draw a collection of planets yeah. and there's a few yeah. stars in between. Yeah. I mean, it's the other way around. <laughs> yeah. So slowly all these ideas of how the world looks like will be transformed and this will inform how we relate to each other culturally and politically mm. and religiously. Mm. So mm. I do think it changes everything. So that's but what it will I'm take some time. Yes, that's, yeah. uh, that's yeah. true. It's not mm. like we wake up and everything has changed no. immediately. That is uh, totally true. Um, so we already brought it up a, a, f a few times, um, interstellar travel. I would love to hear your opinion whether you think it is, it is going to happen or you really believe, like, actually, I don't think it's possible at all. It's just simply too big. Because these are the two positions you always hear from people. Like, yeah, forget, forget about it. Yeah, I think technologically it's possible, but it's, it's still going to take a lot of time. I mean, what, what I'm talking about is like electric propulsion, where you could actually, you could use the interstellar, um, interplanetary interstellar hydrogen, and even though it's like one atom. Could you, uh, could, you, could you explain it a little bit? What do you mean with electric propulsion? Because that's what yeah, you're sorry, working on as yeah, well, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, mean, I mean that you use, uh, the assumption is that you really have a nuclear power source on board, because it's, you don't have to travel very far. You have to travel to Jupiter, and the solar panels are no good on that basically that, okay. that's the limit so we're talking about nuclear nuclear energy on board and already in the 1960s they were looking at actually 100 megawatt 100 megawatt electric uh, generators on board okay to try to support this type of thing but then for political reasons it's, it's really difficult to uh, for the west at least to launch any kind of nuclear stuff into space because of the risk of contamination if it crashes I mean, but curiosity rover has a nuclear no, it's true, but exactly. But you remember when Cassini was going to launch in 1997, it almost didn't get off the launch pad because it had this RTG. So there was oh, a really? yeah. Uh, but, but I agree that then um, the New Horizons then it had quite it down a bit. But an RTG is a radio isotope uh, thermal generator. Yeah. yeah, it's like thermocouples run backwards. So you put heat and then you get a voltage difference. So you yeah have to apply a heat source. The heat source is typically pl plutonium or something which is decaying. So basically, so, you have a lump so of plutonium that decays, that generates a lot of heat, heat, and the heat is transformed into electricity. Exactly. Okay. So, so, uh, so, so, given this, then, then the next thing you need, uh, well, that's we will come to that also. Actually, uh, uh, today at least, the understanding is that we would need a propellant. Uh, that is to say, you have to expel mass 
in the opposite direction to where you want acceleration. How do you combine that with nuclear energy? You can you accelerate the, for example, if you have electric propulsion uh, today, often you use xenon gas, so you use electricity to ionize the gas and then you um, use electric magnetic fields to accelerate it out course, to yes. kilometers per second and then you get your reaction force. Of course. So it's, and, and because then it, it's very efficient, you could have a very low level of acceleration but acting over a long time. And this means ultimately you would achieve incredible velocities. Uh, so it's definitely possible. So it's basically because you're constantly accelerating. Yes. It builds up. It builds up over it's time. It's a slow acceleration, yeah. but because you keep on accelerating yeah. over such yeah. a long time, yeah. you end up with a tremendous speed. Also because yeah. there's no drag. No, exactly. And you just, yeah. Yeah. Related to this is, in fact, a science fiction, almost science fiction <laughs> invention, which you may have heard of, which is this uh, electromagnetic drive, mm -hmm. which is rather fascinating. So today, which you've probably heard of also, you feed in microwaves into this closed cavity and you're getting a thrust and it's really violating uh, Newton's third Law of why could you action. could you could you in a simple way explain why it doesn't seem logic or why why where, yes where it's... No, normally to achieve a, let's say rocket propulsion it's understood that you have to throw mass away behind you in order to move forward much okay. as in a rowing boat you will use your oars to throw water in the opposite direction to where you want to go okay so this has always been a fundamental law of, of, of let's say mechanics invented by Newton in the 17th century and. Um, but now, uh, five different organizations, including two NASA centers, have independently measured thrust when they're basically injecting, I would say, microwave oven microwaves into a closed cavity with a certain shape. They can measure a net force. They're not expelling any propellant. This is the incredibly difficult thing to understand. So suddenly so you would a, just need energy? Yes. And then you can move. And no you don't, propellant. And no propellant anymore. No, no. And that's, and that's, that's really, the, if, if this could be proved to be true, yes. then you have the formula for interstellar travel because there's no pr problem basically having an unlimited energy supply on board. I would say it's the size of the plutonium chunk you take with you. And then you, if you don't need that propellant, you're all set to go. It's yeah, going to take time. That would be it, incredible. It's technically yeah, feasible right? almost today with today's technology. Though. Yes. Yeah. Mats, what do you think about all this uh -huh. interstellar travel? Is it, is it going to happen? It, it, um, that, that, uh, I think Peter said it's all. It, it's, it's going to happen, I'm quite sure. Um, not today and not tomorrow either, but in the future, maybe in the far future. But there will be technology, I'm quite sure. Uh, otherwise, I do not know that much about it, but I knew the standard cliches, if you like, or troops in the science fiction literature, how to go to the stars, generation ships, uh, solar sails, warp drives, warp and drives, and so yeah. on, or even get rid of our bodies, we don't need them, we can get... Uh, That's the transhumanist uh, yes, uh, indeed. approach. Yeah, that way, that's quite a boring way, though. Yeah. There's also the LQ bear drive. Have you heard of... You no, know? in fact not. Yeah, it's a, it's um, a drive which is basically consisting of a, a ring of a still to be discovered material okay. that would it's a it's a theoretical approach at this point and it would bend the space time yes that's right in front of it and mm. behind it yeah. and mm. then it would create this warped space time bubble exactly and in, because if, yeah. if you start warping space. You can move, yeah. You can you can move much faster, yeah. of course. Yeah, there's and a this, NASA, NASA, and there is actually research being done yes. around it. And yeah. It would allow, if I understood yeah. well, it would allow you theoretically yeah. to travel faster than the speed of light, and this would also. Yeah. Uh, but okay. one of the consequences would be that it would accumulate so many uh, particles during the trip, energetic particles, that as soon as you stop, all those particles would be ejected out of the at the front of your starship and you would basically blow up your location of arrival. You could then blow up an entire star system when <laughs> okay. you're arriving. That was one of the latest <laughs> oh dear, theoretical oh com co okay, yeah. complications that they discovered. It was like, hmm, maybe not. Um, but that was an interesting, yeah. an interesting uh, it system. It is fascinating and, and, and I mean, it's clear we haven't, um, humanity has certainly not discovered all the secrets of physics yet. So absolutely, yeah, it would be fascinating if yeah. With rockets, personally, I sometimes feel we're still at the steam age of, yeah, uh, yeah. of, of space technology. Yes. Yeah, they have their limits, absolutely. And, uh, mm -hmm. so, so I, yeah. I have uh, another question about, so, to, go, to go on to continue about interstellar exploration. Um, ecosystems will be needed. And there are two paradigms that I've seen uh, so far that have been developed within uh, mankind searching to establish themselves in outer space. The first one is the Biosphere 2 paradigm, where we recreate Earth 
in a sort of artificial environment and you make it look like Earth. In Biosphere 2 in Arizona, it was an experiment in the 90s where people were living under, under several connected domes with different biotopes. There was a desert and an ocean and different things connected. It was a kind of a failure. I mean, there was lessons learned, but it was also a bit of a failure. Well, why do you uh, think it was a failure? Huh? It was a failure on, on many levels. It was a failure on a technological level, on an ecological level, and on a social level. Um, techn technologically, um, there was a problem with, the, for example, with oxygen. Yes, I heard the oxygen it, yeah. levels uh, went down because part of the oxygen I think was trapped in the concrete. Yes, I right. think that was, yeah. was one mm -hmm. of the problems. Ecologically, you had all these pests that came out. Uh -huh. uh, cockroaches and ants that started eating everything and then socially uh, a kind of war started a psychological war between two uh -huh. factions uh -huh. that have okay. very different ideas on on the, the importance of this experiment so on all that and then of course all these failures compounded each other and so even though there was lessons learned yeah. and we definitely moved forward in our understanding of setting up these systems yeah, yeah. Uh, there were basic flaws because as an ecologist I would never set it up like this okay. I'm much more in favor of another paradigm which is uh, Melissa the Melissa system of the European Space Agency is a good example of this it's to create a regenerative ecosystem that basically re cycles every single molecule that comes out of a human body. We are talking about CO2, toilet waste, sweat, everything comes out. Mm. And the resulting ecosystem is more like a series of microbial reactors. It's mm. microbes breaking down things, turning it into food for plants, and then the plants produce oxygen and can be eaten by the astronauts again. It doesn't look like an ecosystem. So visually, it's, it doesn't really look like, like a, a beautiful environment, but it's actually functionally, it's, it's, it really works. Okay. And these seem to be the two types that are uh, being developed. So I'm not sure, um, yeah, what, what are your opinions or maybe your dreams about bringing biology in outer space? Do you have any visions about this? Uh, what is your opinion about this? Uh, do I have an opinion? I, m maybe one opinion that has nothing to do with biology, maybe. I think uh, everything that, that you mentioned is great, but we still are humans, and I think the deal, the, the, the real problem will be not biology, technology, it will be ourselves, that we will we'll be alone. I mean, for, for instance, if we, if we shoot the first mission one to Mars and so on, even if there are four or six people, they will be so terribly lonely. Okay. And but if we think, so, if we think so far away, so yeah. If we think a little further, if there is like a few thousand people mm. living in, in space stations or on a planet, do you think that's still the main issue? I guess no, no. In that case, there's, there's, there's enough people to, do you think, to create do you think, a kind do of new society. Do you think a community like this, they need biology? Do you need to be surrounded by biology? Or can we get rid of biology and transform it into some technological system that does everything that biology does? Oh, what is it to me, it sounds uh, like a scary really, technocratic really, no. world where yes. everyone sort of I'm <laughs> sure I would like sip, to live sipping in liquids out of test tubes. So yes. It just does not sound a very pleasant place to live. <laughs> no, of course, of course. That's why I'm asking. But functionally, it probably would work, yeah. Functionally, it would yeah, work. But right. I also believe that it's probably going to be a combination of the two. Mm. Um, mm. We will need those functions to be taken care of. Mm. Mm. And sometimes technology might be a good option yeah. to yeah. replace yeah. those functions that biology does. Mm. But the sheer beauty of nature, I mean, it's such a romantic image, mm -hmm. but yeah. my, my personally, my, I'm very curious if we're thinking about interstellar travel and we're thinking about generation starships where people are born on a yeah. starship, will they still long for that biology? Yeah. Is it ingrained in our DNA that I, you will automatically feel attracted to anything that is green and living? Or I if you grow up in a culture where there is nothing like this present, will you not really long for it? Mm -hmm. That's a good, interesting question. Exactly. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> on, the, the, on a slightly different level, I grew up in, in, in southern parts of Sweden, uh, literally in, right in the woods. Okay. So one reason to go to, to live in Stockholm now is I, I hate nature. I hate the woods. I hate <laughs> everything that is green. And I tend to get mad when I read in the paper that we can't build new buildings in Stockholm because there needs to be a, a small little park or something. So, so we can't build the house. I mean, That's your... I want everything to be urban but to go to, to, to 
completely get rid of it in the sense you are talking about. No, I, I guess no. We, I, I guess and you I, think even I would need something green somewhere. Or, please, <laughs> I'm actually quite happy when I walk through Stockholm. There is so much greenery around. Mm-hmm. I would be sad if it all gets replaced by by buildings. But that's uh, you know that's an, another yeah. discussion, I guess. Yeah. I think we can wrap up our uh, podcast. It was a wonderful discussion about our future in outer space. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Peter and Matt, uh, for this uh, insightful conversation. Mm, thank, and, you um, thank you. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.